my name is Chuck Roppel, and I am uh, a vice president of the Network for Grateful Living. And um, I'm so privileged to be here tonight to be able to hold the space uh, to honor someone who is, as we all know, quite remarkable. And before I begin that, I'm going to do the high again because the stop, look, go thing, a great way of getting present with someone you love or want to notice is you just look at them and say, hi. So I'm going to ask you to turn to the person next to you. Don't say a word. Just look at them and say, hi. See what you notice. Yeah. Hi. Hi. And um, you're such good students. Thank you. Uh, that's a way of practicing gratitude. It's about being present. And when the person you look at, you say hi to each other, it's like, oh. So it's something on the order, and it'll just be really quick. I met Brother David 50 years ago, more or less, uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, when I was a Catholic priest, and he was passing through with one of my best friends to do some ecumenical thing, which in 1968 was pretty radical to be doing ecumenical things with weird Hindu, Indian people and whatever. But at any rate, it was, that's when we first met. And... Um, I spent eight years getting ready to be a priest and five years doing it and then realizing it wasn't a good fit, which is a very painful thing when you make that kind of investment and all of a sudden it's got a good fit and then you don't know who you are. And I remember meeting Brother David and through the whole period of time we didn't keep in contact. The last 10 years we've been in a lot of contact, but over that whole period of time he was the anchor. He was just the anchor. If he could do it, anybody could do it. And so what did he have that I didn't? And I'm going to give you, if you were here earlier, he talked about you don't really know music or you don't understand it. You have the experience of music, and that's when you know it. And I wanted to say that the experience of Brother David and his teaching for me can be really summarized in one gesture, and that gesture is the following. I may just leave this on the rest of the night so you don't forget, but basically he told me, and I hadn't heard it before, that spirituality was not about uh, ashes and sacks and things like that. It was about aliveness. And that's what I was wanting to feel was aliveness. And so if I could feel alive, I was practicing having a spiritual practice. That was the most profound thing I had heard of not having sackcloth and ashes. And he actually gave me this red nose. <laughs> you don't remember that, but I, maybe you do. I don't know. At any rate, enough about that. I, this is really says it all. It's like childlike. Is he still childlike? Is, is he childlike? He, somebody said, how did you get to be 90? He said, well, I don't know. It was just a gift. Was he the most playful person up here this afternoon? Yes. And that's it. It's childlike, wonder, awe, and being present. And so I thank you personally for that gift of allowing me to be childlike. And there's a difference between childlike and childish. And he's not that. He's childlike. And this is childlike. So, having said all that, who is this man really that we're going to kind of acknowledge tonight in his legacy? And I'm going to invite up Margaret Wakeley, who's been on the staff of the Network for Grateful Living almost 12 years. She's worked very closely with Brother David, and she's put together a little bio for you so that we can see who this person is in the earliest of days. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah, um, compared to a lot of people here who have known Brother David for decades, I've only known him for 12 years, but I've had the great fortune to be totally immersed in his teachings and, um, and helping other people around the world um, access those teachings and find out about a lot of other people that he's inspired and um, learn a lot about Grateful Living. So 
I love that. I'm really lucky. So I'm going to give you some brief highlights of Brother David's life from 1926 to 2001. At the same time, I'm going to be showing you some images that may or may not correspond with what I am saying, but I think you're going to enjoy both um, the stories and the images. Born in Vienna, Austria on July 12, 1926, Franz Kuno was the oldest of three brothers. He was an adorable, precocious baby and toddler. When he was seven, his parents separated and his mother Elizabeth took the two younger boys to a small village in the Alps. And Franz, staying in Vienna with his father, who promptly sent Franz to boarding school, but not for long. His mother found out how miserable Franz was at that school and she kidnapped him and brought him home to the family. So here they are in the Alps. Franz spent all of his teen years under the Nazis. He was 12 when Hitler came into power in Austria and 19 when the occupation was ended in 1945. When they were back in Vienna those early years, the city and the houses were in shambles, food was scarce, and life and safety were unpredictable. The only thing that they could rely on was the priest coming through the houses at the same time every day serving communion. As Brother David said later, that meant something and continues to mean something to me. With all the problems I have with the institution, there was the institution at its best. With Hitler being against the church, Franz's adolescent revolt against the establishment meant going deeper into his Catholic faith. Around this time, he became interested in a little book that he found called The Rule of Saint Benedict. And with more acts of rebellion, he visited monasteries where he was really not allowed to go. He was drafted into Hitler's army, but luckily never sent to the front lines. He said he used all his drill and barracks time for uninterrupted prayer. And after undergoing frequent humiliations by his superiors, uh, he also cultivated this Christian duty of always questioning authority. Who said that? And why? After several months of serving, he and two others escaped, and his mother hid them at their home for three months until the end of the war. After the war, in the summer of 1945, he volunteered to work with the thousands of refugees flowing into Austria, helping to provide them with food, shelter, and a renewed sense of confidence. He entered the University of Vienna to resume his studies, majoring in art and then psychology, eventually earning a doctorate in psychology in 1953 with a minor in anthropology. I'm not exactly sure when he was a shepherd, but I love this photo. How old, do you know how old you were, Brother David, then? Do you know how old you were? 19, all right. And from 1947 to 1945, he helped to publish a children's magazine in Vienna called Der Golden Wagen. Did your mother also work on that? Did you hear that? He, he was too young, really, to publish this book, but so his mother had to legally edit it. So he had an amazing mother and grandmother. Both Franz's mother, whom his brothers called the Lion Mother, and his maternal grandmother, who was the first woman to ever speak on Austrian radio, were energetic activist women with what Brother David would describe as having that special woman's power, life-giving power that fosters new life and growth. After World War I, for instance, his grandmother worked to help war orphans and would come to the U.S. to raise funds, uh, coming to spend half of every year in the U.S. So, after World War II, Having spent time here in the U.S., Franz's mother and brothers came to live here. Franz also visited the U.S. and Canada uh, several times during the early 50s. He's often said of this time that he was torn, you may have heard this before, finding the perfect girl or the perfect monastery. <laughs> Apparently, there were 
many good-looking, wonderful girls in Austria, but none of the monasteries that he knew of reflected the original teachings of St. Benedict that he had always kept in his thoughts. Then, on one of those trips to the U.S., someone told him about this new little monastery in Elmira, New York, that sounded like what he was looking for. So he hopped on a bus and then hitchhiked the rest of the way to Mount Savior Monastery and almost immediately joined that community and became Brother David. Soon, the abbot, and this was Father Damasus Winzen, right, Brother David? Father Damasus Winzen, could see that Brother David had some kind of talent for speaking and teaching, and he sent him out in the world to teach about monasticism. In that process, Brother David started reading about Buddhist monks. He read Dr. Suzuki's The Training of the Zen Buddhist Monk and discovered that they had little details out of the rule of St. Benedict. They didn't borrow it, really. It just happened to be the same thing. Fascinated by this, quote, common methodical effort to deepen our awareness of that reality which gives meaning to life, he received Vatican approval in 1967 and was sent by his abbot to participate in Buddhist Christian dialogue and live in a Buddhist monastery in New York for three years. So this began a really busy time of Buddhist Christian dialogue. He met with and was encouraged by both Thomas Merton and Thich Nhat Hanh. Interfaith dialogue continued with Swami Sachi Dananda and Rabbi Gelberman too, and in 1968, they formed the nonprofit the Spirit Center for Spiritual Studies, which also included Ido Roshi, Pir Vilayat Inyat Khan, Yogi Bhajan, and Sri Shinmoy. He also met often with Rabbi Zalman Schachter, and in 1975, Brother David received the Martin Buber Award for achievement in building bridges between religious traditions. There he is with Swami Sachi Dananda. I love that photo. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, Brother David was actively involved in civil rights and peace movements and the development of communities. Together with Thomas Merton, Brother David ignited a renewal of religious life. In the 70s, he was a leading figure in the House of Prayer movement. This movement affected more than 200,000 members of the religious orders across the United States and Canada. It emphasized renewing one's spiritual life through prayer and spiritual practices, something he's been a proponent of throughout his life. He helped Peter Stewart found Thanksgiving Square in Dallas, Texas, a place of inclusion and diversity, devoted to the spirit and to all that which, bring, that which brings us outside and beyond ourselves. It was at the encouragement of Peter Stewart there that Brother David carved out time in 1982 as a guest at Peter's house to write Gratefulness, the Heart of Prayer. Brother David has written several books, two published just this summer that you saw here tonight. I think he's writing a couple more right now. And he's co-written several others with writers such as Fritjof Capra, Robert Aiken, and Sharon LaBelle, and has contributed to countless other books. During the 1980s to mid-1990s, Brother David lived in different spiritual communities from Maine to California. And I'm not sure where this was taken. Do you know where that was, Brother David? Big Sur. Well, I was pretty close. Uh, while he was living at the new Kamaldoli Hermitage in California, he was asked to fill in for a teacher at Esalen. And he, of course, said yes. You know, he would do that, and he would come right over. Finding out once that he arrived that the talk was entitled, and I couldn't get he was talk, it was entitled something like The Trouble with Catholicism. <laughs> what, was that the right title? Yeah? Oh, I got it right. I can't believe it. Um, most of my notes come from things that Brother David's written on the, um, in articles off the website and from a book that Claire Hallward wrote called um, Essential Writings of Brother David, and some come from things that I kind of remember him saying, and that was one of them. He's been teaching at Esalen every year since, and Tassahara too. He came to, back to upstate New York to live in Hermitage in Ithaca, New York, 1997, which is where I got to meet him in, 1995, in 2005. So the basic rhythm of Brother David's life has been living as a hermit for half the year, and the other half traveling and offering retreats, 
teaching with colleagues and lecturing. Indeed, he has taught all over the world and continues to do so. He, this is from Claire's book. He buoyantly gives himself to all people, whether his audience consists of starving students in Zaire or faculty at Harvard and Columbia universities, Buddhist monks or Sufi retreatants, Papago Indians or German intellectuals, New Age commune visitors or naval cadets at Annapolis, missionaries on Polynesian islands or Green Berets or participants at international peace conferences. In the late 1990s, Brother David met a young student in Oregon, a computer genius from Serbia, Daniel Jovanovic. They bonded over shared history, albeit decades and countries apart, of living in war-torn countries, carrying the same ever-questioning of authority. Daniel immediately appreciated what Brother David had to say and teach about, and said to him, Brother David, you, sh you should have a website to which Brother David said, yes, what's a website? <laughs> when Daniel described what the World Wide Web and websites were, Brother David said basically, well, forget about a website about me. How about one whose purpose would be to create a community of gratefulness using the internet as a tool to bring people together? So together with friends Gary Fidel and Terry Pierce, they started putting that dream into action. They hired designer Linda Fisher, and together with Daniel's prodigious programming skills and Brother David's writing and creative ideas, they launched gratefulness.org on Thanksgiving 2000 under the umbrella of the nonprofit, the Center for Spiritual Studies. The Fetzer Institute has been key since the very beginning with grants to get the website started. And in 2001, there was a key gathering to begin the, the process of establishing the nonprofit, A Network for Grateful Living. And uh, like a week ago, I found this old report from that meeting, and I could not get over how it still resonates today regarding the needs of this world and how A Network for Grateful Living can respond to those needs. Here is some of what Brother David wrote in that report. What our world needs most is a unified worldview, a shared spirituality, like the one which gave to all creative periods in history their cultural cohesion and power to give meaning to the lives of individuals. Gratefulness is so universal an experience and at the same time so central and so powerful in transforming both individual lives and society as a whole that it can fulfill our contemporary longing for unity. At the core of many communities all over the world and as a driving force in many of the finest efforts, a rejuvenated spirituality is emerging which may well be characterized as a spirituality of grateful living. The task of our network for Grateful Living is not so much to make something happen, but to identify the many communities in which it is already happening and make them aware of it and help connect them, thus strengthening their joint impact. We do not need an additional community or movement, but rather a nerve center that connects existing ones and amplifies their shared energy. Our website, is a tool for the Network for Grateful Living in a twofold sense. It helps bring the networking about, and it serves the purpose of the network by facilitating an exchange of ideas and by giving online support to offline living. Offline action, too. So I would like to close by saying that most of these images that I've shown you are scans of photos from the personal archives of Brother David. Last year, archivists at the University of Massachusetts expressed enthusiastic interest in housing the archives of Brother David. Brother David was delighted to say yes when asked. And now I'm happy to introduce you to Rob Cox, the head of SCUA, Special Collections and University Archives at UMass Amherst. And he can tell you more about the collection. Thanks for coming all this way from Massachusetts, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one thing is right, uh, these flowers are quite beautiful. I appreciate that. 
Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here tonight and an honor as well. And it's, it's a pleasure in part because I'm, I'm coming home in a way. I'm from San Francisco, San Francisco originally and really glad to be here with a group of people who have such interest in common with people in this room and with what we do as archivists. It's a real honor to be here at Brother David's 90th birthday. Uh, it's a special treat for us as archivists to be able to work with people who've done things in their lives that have affected people over and over all across the world. It's an honor for us to be selected as the archive for Brother David. I don't know that you would know what it's like to have boxes arrive at your archive, 75 feet of boxes arriving at your archive, filled with 70 and more years of writing on subjects that touch people, that have so much meaning for understanding the architectonics of spirituality. But here we are at the university, we're still going through these 75 feet of materials, these 70 plus years of writings, of photographs, of letters, of, of writings of every sort that you can imagine. And our job is to make them available to the world. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's a particular pleasure to be here at this place, in this city, at this night. Most of you from this area will know of this spot, Fort Mason, as the point of embarkation for the city of San Francisco. This is the point at which people departed the city for other parts. They got on boats and they went off somewhere. They're going from a place they knew to a place they don't quite know where it will be, what it will be like, and what it will be like. And that's what archives do. As archivists, one of the most important things we do is we create a community for the writings that we are stewards for. At UMass, our specialty is in the history and experience of social change. And we define that very simply. We define that as preserving and disseminating the works of people who make that very simple step to make the world around them better. We have papers of people like W.E.B. Du Bois. I'm not sure, I'm not wearing my glasses at the moment, so I can't quite read what's on the screen here, but we have papers of people like W.B. Du Bois, one of the great theorists of racial justice in, in American history, and I, I might add social justice as well. We have papers of groups like Liberation News Service, who did their best in the 1960s to try to better the world around them by disseminating information. We have 350 years of records of New England Quakers, people who work communally to seek the inward light that draws people together into community. Uh, some of you may know what we do as archivists, and it's actually fairly simple. Uh, what we do as archivists is not quite what you normally think we do. We're not sitting around in a dusty room doing dusty things. What we are are really mediums for communication. This is a picture of me in my previous job, but <laughs> we are mediums of communication. What we do is we take the writings the photographs, the experiences of people, and we record them, we write about them in our own ways. We talk about them, this is a description of Brother David's uh, papers that are up on our collection already. And we talk about them in ways that make them accessible to inquirers, whoever they are, coming from whatever position they are, going to wherever they are in their own search. And we put those words out there for the world to see in hopes of getting people to engage with the content. Because Brother David's paper's in a community of people who are seeking social change, his words speak to W.B. Du Bois, speak to the Liberation News Service, speak to 350 years of Quaker struggle and strife and seeking. We also, more recently, take advantage of the technologies that I think somebody earlier today, maybe two or three times earlier today, said is nothing but a new medium of communication. The web is a means of communication, nothing more and nothing less. And we use that by digitizing Brother David's papers. Uh, we hope, this is something we hope to begin in the, in the not too distant future, and put out there so that Brother David's papers, Brother David's writings, Brother David's photographs can speak to the world directly in an unmediated fashion through this beautiful digital process. Mostly all I wanted to say today is that it's a pleasure and an honor to have that role to play, to be that medium of communication for these ideas that have touched so many in this room and have the potential for touching that many more in the world at large. We're at this point of embarkation here at this place, in this town, at this moment. 
I don't know where we're going to go, but I hope you'll go with us. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. It, 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 it's all celebration, isn't it? Yeah, it's all celebration. Hi. Yeah, see? Works every time. Where's the nose? It's right here. Okay, uh, to move forward, I would like to introduce uh, Dale Byron and ask him to come up. Dale has been on the board. How long, Dale? Decades or so. He's on the board of the Network for Grateful Living. He is a poet. He is an exquisite human being, and he's got a tribute to Brother David. Thank you. Thank you. My religion is surprise. How could you resist a guy that could say something like that? You know, um, it was poetry that brought Brother David and I together. And um, I was amazed at how gracious he was uh, to immediately accept me into this merry band of... Uh, uh, poetry editors, and we used to swap emails and talk about different poems that we were going to put on the website. It was just an absolute delight. And uh, since I had an advanced case, and one of our other fellow board members who asked me if I wanted to be involved with gratefulness, Gary Fidel, and uh, knowing that I had an advanced case of uh, what I call um, uh, adult onset poetry syndrome, no cure for it. I'm trying to spread it now. So that was just such a wonderful um, experience. And one of the other things, I don't know, there's these little known facts I was thinking about when, when Brother David, I love that when he said earlier, he said, I forgot, you know. Uh, and we all do. I think someone asked him, why did you come to the United States? Why did you come to America? And he said, I wanted to get rich. And so I, I just, um, you know, I always thought that was amazing. One of the things that I believe about poetry, and I think this is going to excite some of you, is that poems ought to be short, satisfying, and surprising. And the key word is short. Uh, and I've found that that's been thrilling for a lot of people. So um, <laughs> Brother David asked me for a poem a year ago, and he wanted me to send it to him. And it's a poem by Wendell Berry, and I thought, why not uh, honor him with this poem? And uh, for those of you who have synaptal challenges, you know what I mean when somebody asks you something, you say, oh, I know that person, and you can't quite think of it. So Wendell Berry had a little piece that he wrote called Our Real Work, and he said it like this. He said, it may be, it may be that when we no longer know what to do, we have come. To our real work. And it may be that when we no longer know which way to go, we have come to our real journey. The mind that is not baffled, the mind that is not baffled, is not employed. It is the impeded stream that sings. You never thought about bafflement as being strategic, did you? So when you're confused, just call out this. Just bring this poem. The confu you know, if, if you're not confused, you're not employed. It is the impeded stream that sings. You know, Brother David has taught me a number of things, and I believe... One of the ways that I talk about poetry or I talk about life in general in, uh, in recent times is I say that to be a successful human being, we must be good at two things, plumbing and poetry. <laughs> and the plumbing part is the part about getting stuff done. And if you've ever had it back up on you, you know what problem that can be. But you see, Brother David is not just about the poetry. The poetry is about the why. If we don't have poetry, life gets so tedious. 
that we find it a burden to just go on. But with poetry, we understand the why. We understand the amazing things that this life can be. But without the plumbing, without getting up every day, without actually making things happen in the world, the poetry is just frustrating. But I tell you, with the poetry and the plumbing, it gets as amazing as his life. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. The next person uh, that I'd like to invite up um, is Anthony Chavez. And Anthony had the opportunity to travel with Brother David for six years around the world. Um, he was a kid then, and he's still a kid. <laughs> and he's a delight, Anthony Chavez. Good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, happy birthday again, Brother David. Um, thank you to everyone in the audience who took us in along the way and who were friends to us and uh, gave us so much and, and really opened up the world to me in so many ways and, than I could ever imagine. Um, this story is about uh, my journey being on the road uh, with our dear friend, Brother David, um, and it's a story about really me, the monk, and the monkey. I think a lot of us know Brother David for being uh, the pioneering interreligious dialogue figure we just heard about from Margaret, and as we also heard about, uh, as being archived through, through UMass. Um, but when I met Brother David, it was through pure serendipity. We met at a peace conference in San Jose, one that I wasn't even invited to. I was sent to as a fill-in. And when I arrived, I didn't really know what to expect. I kind of had my socks knocked off by this old, cool, wise guy. And I thought, wow, that's great. Now I'm on my way off to Sacramento to see my special friend, and nobody's going to know I'm leaving. And before I knew it, the organizers wrapped me into a lunch where I knew nobody. It just so happened that Brother David sat down next to me. We started sharing he discovered I was a religious studies student, and all he told me was that I should check out a website called gratefulness.org. Well, I went along my way, and little did I know I was sitting to a pioneer, and really, for me at that point in time, it was a primary source. All I was trying to do was graduate college. I wasn't interested in life questions. I was just trying to jump through the hoops and do what I needed to do. Um, so once I found out, to my chagrin, I realized I missed this wonderful opportunity to interview Brother David about the civil rights movement and the Eightfold Path of Buddhism and all that stuff. But as fate works out, Brother David got in contact with me through those conference organizers, um, told me that he'd be needing some more help in California, and so I thought, well, I'll join him. And, and so I took a, a leave of absence from a political campaign that I was working in and what really captured my heart and still has my heart. And I spent some time with uh, a, dear, a dear friend, or what became a really dear friend. And in those first two weeks, we just kind of hit it off, and I thought that was it. You know, I thanked Brother David. I was happy to go my way. And I was just really thankful for that one experience. Well, little did I know that Brother David appreciated how instinctive and intuitive I was at helping him with all of his needs, and little did I know that there were some board members of a network for Grateful Living in those retreats who also had acknowledged how well I was doing. And so soon thereafter, Brother David sent an email just before I graduated from college and asked me, you know, what are you doing next? And I said, I have no idea. I don't even know what you're supposed to do with a religious studies degree. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to figure it out. And he said, well, I have an idea. And boy, was he prescient. He helped me survive this awful recession with a religious studies degree. 
by offering me an invitation first to Hawaii to go and to celebrate my graduation from college. But then that was also where he dropped upon me this huge, uh, ambitious, audacious, noble goal to, uh, to assist him in, in, a, in a farewell tour, so to speak, of going around and sharing in many of the places that he had been before to share his message of grateful living. And so we're sitting down in front of the Pacific Ocean, and he asked me to pull out my notepad, and he starts rattling off a whole series of cities from Santa Fe to the Grand Canyon to Rome to Vienna, Zurich, and back to the United States and to Alaska. And I just put down my notepad and started laughing. I was like, are you serious? We're going to go to all these places in six months? I was like, that's impossible. I only know these places through the skateboarding videos I was interested in at the time and still am interested in. And he said, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. I said, okay. And so before we took off on those trips, he was uh, kind enough to be interested not only in me, but my family. And so we got a chance to spend some time with my family. And he asked my mom, you know, what's something that I should know about Anthony before we begin our travels? And my mom told him, you know, you got to be careful. The kid is really, really impatient. And uh, over the years, Brother David saw how short I could be on patience. But he also acknowledged how much I grew in, in the area of patience. And that was his way of teasing me and letting me know how much I grew was by reminding me after a long and tiring day how patient I had been. You know, when I look back on it all, it's, uh, it's really funny that we became such good friends. Um, in a lot of ways, we're cut from, from just... <laughs> Oh yeah, there's, there's the, the clown noses where it all began. In a lot of ways, we come from opposite ends of the universe. Brother David, an Austrian, Benedictine monk, well-trained in all the classics. Me, a young Latino kid from California who mostly cared about skateboarding at the time he was graduating from college. And little did I know that actually the different forms of knowledge we had would actually complement each other quite a lot. Brother David taught me more about psychology and spirituality and about the classics, fine art, poetry. And I took the time to talk with him about contemporary politics, to teach him about the different generations of hip-hop, to teach him about the art of graffiti. And as you saw, by the end of it all, you know, Brother David actually became a, a, a pretty um, appreciative um, individual looking up into every corner, underneath every bridge, <laughs> spotting every single, um, spotting every single, you know, uh, opportunity he could to uh, to point out some new graffiti to me, and to to remind me of of how pointing it was and and how it spoke in a new way, and and it was just really fun to be able to to develop this friendship with somebody who was so different from me, but yet who in a lot of ways held a lot of the same questions that I held and had nurtured those questions for a lifetime and wanted to go back and, and to share all of that experience, to share that hard-earned wisdom. You know, as I, as I look back at the different stages of our travel and, and how I graduated and matured, you know, at first, as I mentioned, it was instinctive, it was natural, I saw this cool old wise guy as another grandparent. And so it was just helping him out with the basic things, reminding him that he needed some water because he was sounding a little parched, helping him locate his pen or his glasses. Eventually, as I became more uh, studied in the subject matter that he was presenting on, it was helping him put together presentations, helping him refine his comments, even at times, you know, whispering into his ear a helpful little response that I thought would really tie things up. And eventually, I think what I came to see my most important job and, and my role and my duty was, was, was to making sure that not only did my friend go out and, and do a great job, as he always wanted to do, being the number one on the Enneagram, the perfectionist that he is, but also to learn how to more perfectly enjoy the gifts that were offered to both of us while being on the road together. 
And so over time, we got a little bit better, and I say a little bit better, at being kinder and softer with each other. As many of you probably know in this room, it wasn't that easy for uh, two people from opposite ends of the universe to spend such, such, such a great amount of time together in such close confines. And so many times, uh, some of you in this room would offer Brother David and I some mediation skills. <laughs> they would offer us some space uh, to breathe and to sort out our grievances because they knew that there was a long road ahead and they knew that uh, we were in it for the long haul. So um, I guess mostly I just want to say, you know, thanks, hermano, uh, for inviting me to, to be a part of these special years of your life. Um, it was a pleasure to be your co-pilot. <laughs> and thank you for being mine. taken with um, knowing Brother David's roots and his commitment to social justice. Because you see, what monks do is they go away and they take a look at the interior life. And they really focus on it. That's what monasticism is. What Brother David makes him unique is he takes that hard focus six months out of the year and looks at the interior life and comes out and provides a map for how to live the exterior life, the external life well. And, and listening to you, Anthony, and knowing your background and your grandfather's background of Cesar Chavez and social justice, the two of you intersecting generations apart, is, it's, a, it's, it's the mystery revealing itself. It's the conversation that's trying to be had across all generations and all nationalities. So I thank both of you for for revealing that to us and, uh, and sharing that with us. And, and I'm going to quickly, because uh, time was of the essence, Brother David uh, in 2000, as you know, along with other people, had the vision to create a network for grateful living. And uh, it's now 16 years old. Uh, there was gratefulness.org uh, 1.0, and last year we were able to, through support from funders like yourselves, create uh, gratefulness.org 2.0, and I hope there was a 3.0 and a 4.0. Uh, but I wanted to just uh, show you, this is our homepage, and just to give you some of the results of what's happened in the last, we, we launched this last summer not without some stumbling. We stumbled around a lot because we, that's what happens when you launch new technology. Uh, but we're very proud of what we've created in the last year. Uh, and it's going to quickly go through it. But people can, over the 20 million people, have, people have lit in candles since we started in the beginning. That's a lot of candles, and no flames were burned. There's something about virtual reality that when I send you a candle that's lit, it moves you. It's like saying, hi. It presents you. And you can put it on your computer, and it lives for 48 hours. The, uh, there's the word for the day that now goes out. Uh, each month to, uh, you know, over, uh, I don't know how many subscribers, a million and a half times. I mean, this ripple, and I don't want to get hung up in the numbers because it's impact, and we don't know how to measure that except we ripple like a river. So I, my invitation to you, and I'm going to go through this rather quickly, is marinate with the site. It is alive. It is alive. It's different every day. Uh, you can send e-cards. And uh, one of the staff reminded me that we get wonderful results from elderly people, which is I'm one of them, who uh, have a hard time with postage and going to the post office, and they love that they can send a virtual e-card now. So it's like people do know how to use these services. Um, 
All of Brother David's writings and teachings as best we can are on the site. You can access them. They're organized. There's, there's, there's 50 years of material there. Uh, not organized the way that the archivists are, but there are that are, have access to it. lives forever, part of the legacy. Um, there's the ABCs of Grateful Living. There's all sorts of places to look and go. This is the way we di dig into the mystery and have it be alive and serve the world as a whole. Quickly, um, we, uh, there's a daily question. Uh, you can light a candle, as I said, send a card. There's a, you can have a practice gratitude, private gratitude journal that you can go to. There, I have it online. No one knows it's there. I write in it every day. Uh, it's a wonderful thing that's being developed uh, by lots of people around the world. We're now in over 100 countries. Those dots represent a country. Uh, and there are 10,000 people just in the last year who put their profile on our site. So we now have a gratitude lounge where people can come and talk to each other daily, and they do, uh, with different issues that they're dealing with. So I just want to, this is about you, Brother David, and what you have birthed in the world. And uh, it continues to live and be vital and alive. We're healthy. We're moving into from adolescence as an organization into, we think, pre-adulthood. And we're very excited about that, and we wanted you to know about it. So marinate in the site. Go hang out. It's, you can get word for the day. Just subscribe. It's free. It changes every day. And it's that high thing. It's that thing that has us stop, look, and go. And with having said that, I want to invite uh, Christy. Are you next? You're not next, okay. Uh, I actually want to, uh, there you go. And we also, you know, this is uh, social media all over the place. So we're, we're spreading like a virus. Thank you. Uh, that's the whole idea. Thank you. Okay. In, in a little bit of a way, I'm preaching to the choir, so tell your friend. Hmm? Right. Now, Next, I would like to invite up three, three, two members of the board and one who acts like a board member and behaves and contributes like a board member. Gary Fidel, a co-founder, and uh, Alberto Rizzo, and Miriam Neith, Luz, didn't say it right. Miriam, come on up and bring your two children. Miriam is from Germany and supports the German website. Alberto is from Argentina. His family is here, and he supports the Spanish-speaking website. And Gary supports all of us with his generosity and kindness. I'm going to ask, just have a seat. Miriam, I'm going to ask you to go first, and please introduce your lovely boys. Good evening to all. Um, <laughs> this is Gabriel, and this is Nicolas. And I'm happy they came with me to be here with you. <laughs> and I'm still moved by what uh, Anthony had been sharing. And just by listening, listening to Anthony, you see that um, there are so many traces around the world and so many people and um, countries. Brother David, you have put your f feet in and... Um, hearts you have touched over there. So um, as we are standing here and better too, I'm just representing so many other people who could stand here at the same time. Um, in this case, I'd like to say some words on behalf of the European Network for Grateful Living. Um, yeah, and it's, I think it's, so much could be said and so little needs to be said. And all of you know that. Um, with you, Brother David, I think being silent is uh, one of the biggest gifts, and there's so much dialogue in being silent with you. <laughs> Many of you know that. And by giving your full presence in each encounter and um, letting the light shine in each person you are with, that's one of the biggest gifts in this world, I think. And I guess all of you can relate to that when I say that. So... Um, <laughs> Um, I want to give gratitude on behalf of the European network and I think all people, we've been traveling in the desert, in the African desert, in Sahara, also with Anthony and, and Felipe, I, all those people could probably say the same in a certain way. I, th I would like to give gratitude on behalf of all of us for the traces of love you have um, 
I think, woven into our hearts or just reminded of us that um, this is possible just by full presence and by letting the light shine in others. And Gabriel Nicolas would like to read a quote each, and it's um, from Albert Schweitzer, which is German-French. So he played the organ in our home church, Bach, a lot at that time. And those two quotes, they speak to me, and Gabriel will read one, and then Nicolas. At times, our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. Albert Schweitzer. The only thing of importance when we depart will be the traces of love we have left behind. Albert Schweitzer. Thank you, and that's what I hope that we all together, and it's much about together and community and all this um, through the networks, and as has been said so beautifully before, just by making visible what is there already, because there's so much there in different, so many different flowers in a wild flower field, but connecting them and um, showing the beauty of all that in times where this is really needed to fear not, to praise, life and the mystery of life and um, to trust in life and we can do all this together beautifully i think thank you very much good evening <clears throat> well as medium i will try to represent um, the last kid of Brother David, uh, he started traveling uh, to Argentina three years ago, only three years ago, and uh, now we feel part of the family, of this huge family. Um, his presence, uh, he started in Argentina, was so meaningful and really changed the heart of a lot of people that uh, we, uh, try to imitate what uh, the other communities were doing all around the world. And we create our own homepage, Vivir Agradecidos, and our own foundation to try to replicate what everybody was doing after New Brother David and change their, their lives. Um, so we were lucky to receive him three years ago and uh, we did a lot of things. Uh, he's so generous that he never said no. We took him uh, to high up in the mountains. Probably he was very close to get freeze. We, um, uh, only to make a, a book, a very nice book, but uh, really we risk his life. <laughs> and. Uh, we asked him to uh, do some water rafting through a very wild river in Patagonia. <laughs> and with a huge smile, he always said yes. And um, anytime I ask him, hey, Brother David, what if we do this? His first reaction is, oh, what is going to tell me Beto? Because he's very dangerous. He proposed me very, very weird things. But he is so, so generous that he always say yes. Um, so he really touched us, uh, he started touching our family, uh, and, and we were so happy uh, uh, that we felt the need to share this with our friends. And uh, uh, now the, the family uh, in the Spanish-speaking community uh, especially in Latin America, is huge. We have 150,000 followers in Facebook, and only in three years, and we have uh, uh, 1,000 uh, visitors per day uh, in, in the homepage, and this really is making a big change in, in our community. So I will try to rep uh, 
represent uh, the community that uh, sent in uh, uh, the day of Brother David's birthday more than 1,000 messages uh, to him. So, uh, Lizzie and Clara, my, my wife and my daughter, they select a few of them, and I would like to, write, uh, to read them so you get an idea of what Brother David means uh, to, to the Latin American guys. He is the human being who has inspired me through his way of living and who gave me wings to fly. The grateful life that coexists with the universe which makes this world a better place cheers up the heart. The heart. If I had not met him, I would be living in a very different way. That smile, that contemplation, that face that knows, that loves. God bless Brother David. God has blessed me by meeting him. Diego. Another one. The youth in your eyes is for me a testimony of your healthy core. My best wishes from you, from here to you, Brother David, Angie. Laura, he is cancer. That explains it. Every morning when I smell my coffee, I think of him and his heartfelt gratitude. It is so simple that the message is transmitted beyond words. Happy birthday. Carmen, I thank God and your mother because your marvelous existence. Happy birthday, Brother David. Fabiana, thanks you, dearest Brother David, for planting your seeds of love and gratitude in Latin America. You will always have a place of honor in our hearts. We love you. Have an awesome birthday. So we have many more, but uh, we already said everything. Um, so I would like to look at the, your eyes. We are very far, but I have that feeling in my heart. I have that experience. Uh, and with an intense will to belong, you taught us, taught us how to belong. Uh, I will feel once more to be at home. And with this incredible experience, let's be open to the amazing surprise that life gives to us. And be ready to new adventures. So life continues. Thank you very much, David. Good evening. I'm amazed to find myself here in front of you at this time. It was 16 years ago that we created an organization that would feature Brother David's and others' teachings about gratefulness. I never dreamed so many people from all over the world would be touched by this work. In 2013, Brother David gave a TED Talk. Want to be happy? Be grateful. Over five million people have viewed this talk so far. He starts out by saying, one thing all humans have in common is that each of us wants to be happy. And happiness, he suggests, is born of gratitude. The more grateful we are, the happier we are. Also, the science is becoming very clear. Grateful living is healthy living. So, how can we become more grateful? Easy, with practice. Brother David came up with a simple but a powerful way to practice, adopting a process 
we learned as children while crossing the street. Stop, look, and go. Stop whatever you're doing and devote your full attention to the present moment. Look, notice and observe what life is offering you right now. Go. Do something with the awareness and opportunity which gratefulness offers you. I think it would be fun if we can experience this practice together. We're going to start with a deep breath and I'll walk you through it. Ready? Stop. Close your eyes and breathe deeply. With your full awareness, take a deep breath and let it out slowly. Look, where you are right now, here in this space, celebrating the life of this very special man, Brother David. Now go. Use this opportunity to appreciate and feel grateful for his presence in your life. Let's all send him our love and fill his heart to overflowing. Congratulations, you have just exercised your gratitude muscle. I was personally inspired after Brother David's TED Talk. With his encouragement, I worked with my stepdaughter Carrie and my wife Candace to create a book using his simple but powerful method. We adapted practices with permission from gratefulness.org and the Greater Good Science Center to fit this format. The title of this book is Stop, Look, Go, a Grateful Practice Workbook and Gratitude Journal. This book contains 32 different practices that invite you to deepen your experience of gratitude. It also includes various scientific studies showing the health benefits of gratitude. I'm thrilled to announce tonight the publication of this book in service to our offline mission to spread gratefulness throughout the world. Everyone in attendance this evening will be gifted a book as you leave the theater. My wish for each of you Thank you. My wish for each of you is that your life is happier and better as you learn to practice living gratefully. I'm profoundly grateful to you, Brother David, for being my teacher, friend, and mentor these past 30 plus years. This book is dedicated to you, and I would like to present it to you at this time. Thank you. I just want to comment that, um, as I said, these are board members. These are engaged board members who are active and committed, and you can tell there's a great affection, and it's just a privilege to be part of this community. Now, speaking of being part of the community, I want to bring back Christy Nelson, who you met earlier today, who is our executive director and who is an amazing firebrand and has done great things for us, and she has a few words with you. Thanks. Thank you, Gary, Candace. 
Yeah, it's awesome. You will all be, we're going to try to coordinate it, so make sure you leave out one of the legal doors if you want a book, and they'll be out here, and we'll have volunteers handing them out so that you can be sure to leave with a, uh, this gift. Um, it's interesting because a network for Grateful Living, uh, when I met Brother David, uh, Brother David is an interesting person because he both is so deserving of and in some ways um, relishes the receiving the attention for the teachings that he represents and he shuns the attention in a certain way that's all focused on him. Um, he's always wanted the work to be larger than him and so a network for grateful living is a lifetime of his teachings which has become a larger lifeline for a whole community of people around the world. It's a really interesting balance to strike, and it's really been in, in with the deepest of respect for Brother David that we've tried to centralize all of his teachings and his work and expand on it. And I think I, I have a bow from Brother David that there is this sense of broadening it and expanding it so that it lives beyond him and the importance of this. So the Legacy Fund, you guys got to hear about this. Um, Legacy is really about lived values, and so I'm here to do a really quick um, reminder to you guys about how much it matters to continue to invest in the things that you love, and hopefully in the things that we do that you love, and continuing to build this movement that uh, continues this lifetime and this legacy of what Brother David stands for, to preserve, to digitize, to continue to expand what we're able to put on our website, and to keep it for generations to come. So uh, a big shout out to the Fetzer Institute for supporting this event so that every single dollar raised is going to the Legacy Fund. So all of you who bought a ticket, all of you who bought books, yes, thank you. Um, every single gift that's been made, every single dollar that's been um, exchanged in this campaign in honor of Brother David is all going to his Legacy Fund. So we're about halfway to where we, we wanted to raise $90,000, and we're officially tonight at about 45000 So we really hope that you'll continue to invest in what we're doing and what we're standing for and what we're up to in terms of preserving Brother David's work, celebrating it. And um, for the next week or 10 days or so on your phone, you can find, it says Legacy. You can make a gift online, um, and 100% of your support will go to Brother David's Legacy Fund. So I'm uh, uh, really aware of Nipun's uh, challenge to ask without asking. And how do you do that? I think the thing that you do is you say, here's the difference it's going to make. It makes a difference to hundreds of thousands of people every single year, millions of people every single year who are longing for the gifts that Grateful Living bring to their lives, for whom it is a true lifeline. And we hear about it every single day from people everywhere, from all walks of life, that this way of living, this way of loving, this way of learning is bringing them hope and courage that they never had before. So I just want to tell you that that's the difference it makes, and that's asking without asking and with a deep bow. I turn it over. So thank you for your support that you've given so far, and hopefully you'll continue to give. Thank you, Christy. And um, I should like Margaret and Saoirse to stand, please, because I want to recognize the staff who just hold so much for all of us. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, next is, um, we're now moving outside the circle. This is not going to go on forever, I promise. We're moving outside the circle, and the first person to help us with that is Michael Lerner. Michael, would you come forward? And Michael, by the way, is the founder of Commonweal, and he's just had his 40th anniversary of extraordinary service in the community. It's pretty amazing. Deeply honored to have you as a service provider. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chuck. Brother David, I'm going to try to say nothing that has been said already. I, I want to 
I want to express gratitude that you are so alive and vibrant at the age of 90. Just, um, you know, you give us hope about what we can be. Um, I want to give thanks, this hasn't been mentioned, for uh, Pope Francis, who we've been given uh, as uh, a truly extraordinary uh, Catholic leader in my judgment. And I like to think of Brother David as the Francis to Pope Francis. I like to think of Brother David as what Pope Francis would like the Catholic Church to be if he were free to make it what he would like it to be. I want to thank Brother David for the full-bodied spirituality that he embraces. I want to thank him, if memory serves, for having carried a book of Rilke's poems with him during World War II and when he was drafted into the Nazi army and having carried Rilke and loved Rilke's love poems and having said that the holiest people that he has met, Mother Teresa and others, are the people who are most alive at all levels and that it isn't simply the higher levels but that all the levels should light up in a full-bodied spirituality. And finally, I want to turn to us and, and say what is the best way that each of us can pay tribute to this man who means so much to each of us. And it seems to me that the way to do that is to ask how this is working on us this evening. To ask in each of our hearts and in each of our beings what is taking place tonight? Because I feel in myself, and I sense with my wife Cheryl, I know, and with others, that something is happening here, that there is a form of darshan taking place that is acting on each of us very deeply. So my question for myself and others is, how far can we take this in? Because it seems to me that the real gift that we can offer Brother David on his 90th birthday is not so much to shower him with our thanks, but simply to look inward to ourselves and say, how courageous can we be in allowing this to work on us and become who we truly are? Thank you, Brother David. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Charles and Michael got up at 4.30 this morning <laughs> to make this special occasion tonight. Uh, thank you so much. It was, thank you. It was really brilliant. Uh, we have an unexpected guest I want to acknowledge, invite him to say just a few words. Jack Cornfield is here, and Jack, please come. Does anybody not know who Jack Cornfield is? <laughs> Welcome home. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy to be here. And, and what you just said, Michael, I'm, I'm moved and touched and inspired um, and always inspired by Brother David. And as I came over here, um, I was listening to the Democratic National convention in Philadelphia, which was um, raucous and somewhat divisive between the Hillary and Bernie people and so forth. And then Paul Simon got up in the middle of the divisiveness and sang Bridge Over Troubled Water, and the whole room started to feel the bridge. And really, that's what Brother David does. You know, I think about, uh, one of my favorite things about the Dalai Lama is the way he greets people, because he'll be in a room like this, like Brother David was signing those books so beautifully, 
And when he takes your hand, he'll go down and he'll meet people. It's not like a politician, how many babies can you kiss one to another? But he takes your hand and then he doesn't let go. And you know, you'll go, oh God, I'm with the Dalai Lama, like that beautiful picture of Brother David and the Dalai Lama, you know. And you, you feel so happy and excited. And then he holds on and he doesn't let it go. And he waits until there's that moment when you go, oh, you really meet heart to heart, somehow he's really there with me. And that's that same presence. They're really brothers, as we know. Um, and so in your honor, Brother David, I, I could tell Brother David's stories, but uh, one of my favorite stories from your tradition as a bridge between Esalen and the, you know, Kamaldolis on the mountain and the bridge between so many cultures and, and so forth, um, is from the Christian Desert Fathers, and there was a, there was a famous abbot um, who had a monastery out in the desert and had uh, with him a beautiful uh, copy of the Holy Bible um, that was in, engraved and embossed, something very special. And there was a young man who came to become a brother at this monastery, and seeing how valuable it was, he stole it and went off with it and went back down to Alexandria where he tried to sell it and he brought it to a great um, person, merchant in the marketplace and said, I want to sell this. And the merchant said, um, how much do you want for it? And he said, 16 gold coins. Merchant said, let me keep it for a few days that I might find out if it's that valuable or not. Um, and so he took it to the abbot and said, um, someone has brought this Bible in, and do you think it's worth 16 gold coins? And the abbot said, yes, it's a fine volume. It's worth at least that much. So he went back, and the young man came in um, to get his money and said, so uh, will you pay me? And he said, oh, of course I will. I went and I took it to um, Father Abbot, and he told me it was worth at least that much. And the young man froze and he said, he said, nothing else. And the merchant said, nothing else. And he said, wait, I can't sell it. And he began to weep and he grabbed the book and he ran back to the monastery. And he said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I've taken this. And the abbot said, here, I make a gift of it to you. And from then on, that young man became a brother who lived in that monastery for the rest of his life. And I like to tell this story not only because it's a beautiful story of generosity, which is another flavor of the gratitude that, that Brother David expresses so beautifully, but because the story, the generosity, the gratitude um, is not about the abbot or about Brother David. It's actually what gets touched in us, that you hear that story and you say, yes, isn't that beautiful? And you say, yes, isn't that beautiful? Um, because you know what's beautiful, that there is a good heart born in you, the original goodness, um, the beauty that you, that you are as a human being from your birth, the, the fundamental nobility, Buddha nature, there are all these languages, your divine nature. Um, and the gift of that abbot and the gift of Brother David is that they are transparent to this gift that we all have. And so in being themselves so beautifully, in being himself, um, he reminds us that we too carry this gold. So I thank you, Brother David, from my heart. And happy birthday. privilege to be with so many extraordinary teachers. Uh, and particularly, I don't know if you've noticed, you, how could you not, the seagulls. They like the best. We are now going to uh, show you a very brief video of tributes from people who were not necessarily able to be here. So, am I right? <laughs>
Brother David, you have been an inspiration for me for over 30 years, and I'm deeply grateful to you for your guidance and your friendship. You have an amazing ability of expressing deep spiritual truths in simple, direct language. A little bit like a Zen master, but Zen mit Wiener Scham. Happy 90th birthday. Prosit. Dear Brother David, I am so grateful for our friendship. I'm so grateful for your life. I'm so grateful for your teachings, for your wisdom, for your humor, for your compassion, and I'm grateful for your mother. It's your birthday. And your father. It's your birthday. Brother David, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being a close friend. Thank you so much for being an inspiring teacher. Thank you so much for your courage, for your dedication, for your amazing ability to see what truth is and to bring that wisdom forth in the world. Thank you, Brother David. Beloved Brother David, you have borne so many profound gifts into my life. They appear unbidden like the wildflowers you so love. You have brought me to my senses while reminding me of our common sense. You have illuminated with the delicious timbre of your voice the beauty of words and the depth found in simple things. You have demonstrated how a spiritual life can be one of passion and delight as well as silence and prayer, how one can find grace in suffering and in struggling with the darkness. Perhaps above all, I treasure your gift of friendship. Thank you. With love, always. Dear, dear brother David, I wish I could be with you in person to celebrate you, to honor you. But I'm starting my own seminar in Oregon, Go Beach. You remember you visited us almost 10 years ago, and uh, we will have a group of people who know you, who also will join me to celebrate you, to honor you. Wish we should all be there to join all of you for this special occasion. Wish we could be there, but we will be with you in spirit. And we want to continue to honor you for the next decade. And we join together and dance with you on your hundredth birthday. We love you. We are grateful for who you are. And we could be there, but we will be with you and dance and sing with you. Have a wonderful time. We love you. Dear Brother David, thank you very much for sprinkling sparks of magic on my past 30 years ago and continuing to shine beams of light toward my way ever since. The conversations with you on freedom and other topics helped me getting a better understanding of basic aspects of our existence in this world. Happy 90th Geburtstag and many returns for me, Andrea and Daniel. My dear brother David, it is an honor to be able to wish you directly birthday love and to send you birthday love on this occasion of your 90th birthday. I was first introduced to you and your work more than two and a half decades ago. And what I remember was you pointing out to me and to the listeners of your program, The Grateful Heart, how this entire creation has been given to us. And it was that word, given, that really struck me and has stayed with me. How everything here came unearned as a gift. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out to me in a way that has always stuck. 
Thank you for your deep graciousness and blessedness and soft and powerful footprint on the earth. With great love, my good brother David, happy 90th birthday. Dear brother David, I would like to use this uh, very auspicious uh, occasion to express my deep gratitude for having had you as part of uh, my life and uh, our life. And thank you for everything you have uh, contributed to the future of this planet. Uh, you certainly will be in my mind and, and heart. Um, although I cannot be present uh, personally, I am uh, in Germany uh, currently. And uh, I don't know if you heard that I was recently married. I would like to introduce you uh, to you, uh, Brigitte uh, Ashauer, now Groff, uh, uh, whom you probably don't remember, but she was in a couple of months long, so she, she knows who you are, and she would like to add a few words. Well, I would, I would like to thank you too for everything you have done and uh, for the light that you're bringing into this world. And uh, I wish you a wonderful birthday. We wish you a wonderful birthday. And I hope to happy, see you again. <laughs> happy, happy birthday and many happy returns. Much, much love to you. Much love. Brother David um, has been one of the most important and powerful teachers I've ever had in my entire life. And being steeped in gratefulness or the gratefulness of life uh, as a result of Brother David's teachings, his presence um, in my life, in my home, in my family, um, it's unparalleled. Um, I love you with all my heart, Brother David. I'm so proud to be your friend. and. Uh, and colleague. I love that we do Lent together uh, uh, in a way that totally nourishes my life. Uh, and I love your teachings, your love, your uh, honesty, and the great fullness you give to my world and to this world. God bless you. Thank God you were born. Uh, at the same time when I could be in, in life with you and happy, happy, happy birthday. May you live another 90 years and set the record uh, for the longest living uh, teacher, mentor, human being on this planet. Happy birthday. I am so deeply grateful for the many years we spent together co-leading groups. I learned so much from you each time I worked with you in the meeting room, at Vespers at the Hermitage, in the natural hot springs at Esalen, on the wild paths of Big Sur, engulfed in natural beauty, in the time we shared together. I have borrowed, built upon, and probably even plagiarized words I heard you speak that I now share with the groups and individuals I work with. I stand on your shoulders, and your offerings ripple out into the world, touching so many in seen and unseen ways. You mentored me in the spoken word of poetry, how to read it, how to listen, how to deeply listen. Asculta, asculta, listen. Before our group sessions, we would sit for a moment in silence together. This is what I can offer you now, a breath of silence from the wilds of Big Sur. <sighs> A deep gasho to you, Brother David. Lieber Bruder David, finde es wunderschön, dass ich die Gelegenheit kriege, dir auf diese Weise ganz herzlich zu deinem runden, topfrunden Geburtstag zu gratulieren. In allererster Linie aber möchte ich dir heute Danke sagen, dass du überhaupt in mein Leben gekommen bist. Danke sagen für deine Besuche bei uns für all die Gespräche bei Tisch, die Essen, die ich jeweils mit einem schümli kaffee abrunden durfte. Es war immer wunder, wunderschön zusammen mit dir. Danke, dass ich dir meine geliebte Heimat Appenzell zeigen durfte. 
Danke für dein Dasein. Danke, Bruder David. Hello, dear Brother David. Happy Birthday. And thank you very much for sharing so many years of your life with us. Stopping many places like Alpsigl, Esselen, Felsentor, many more. Yes, and looking at beauty, at truth, at wisdom. But foremost, thank you for letting us experience, Verena and me, you at Alpenblick, sometimes in our Sangha, experience the beer is the monk in you, the monk that stopped, that looked, and that did. Thank you a lot. Happy birthday, Brother David. Hi, Brother David. It's Norman Fisher. It's been a long time since we've seen each other, but I just wanted to make a short video to say thank you for orienting me and bringing into my heart Christianity, which healed the wound that all Jewish people have always felt about Christianity for the last few thousand years. And you've shown me Christianity's love, which changed my whole life change my relationship to Buddhism and to Judaism. Brother David, I hope we will see one another again before this short life is over. And please do take care of your dear self. And maybe I'll bump into you at Tassahara one of these days, or maybe we'll just have to cook something up. Thank you so much for giving me, giving me the opportunity to make this video. And may you have many, many wonderful hours of accepting these great tributes that are rolling in right now. Good night. Brother David, I am so sad that I can't be at what I am sure is a joyful and wonderful celebration. You have made such a beautiful imprint on the world in your 90 years. And my time with you in Austria last year was a high point of my life of conversation. Also, herzlichen Glückwunsch und zutiefste Dankbarkeit. Context of this poem is Brother David and I had just finished teaching a workshop in the big house at Essel Institute. And the bigger context is David was making a shift from a very public life, very busy life, and returning to that of a life as a monk life of solitude, life of seclusion. This was August of 1996, his last public workshop at Eslam. And at the end of this workshop, I wrote this poem and read it to the group and to Brother David. The name of the poem is Contemplation of a Monk for Brother David, August 1996. Innumerable labors, causes, conditions have brought us this dancing prayer of a man, a monk, sometimes hermit, that some have called a priest. Now he is sure to deny the latter, ever quick to point out, not a priest, a monk instead. And the differences are great. Yet I have seen him give communion as it was meant to be given, a priest of the wild, the rebels, the half-forgotten edges, breathing aliveness into dead and dying traditions, hearing confessions of pain caused, pain felt, a listening heart that mops up despair. On one summer evening near the full moon, I saw him turn himself into a coyote. He ran the grassy hills of the Big Sur, causing mischief, as only coyotes can do. Perhaps it was spring. I saw him as a frog in Basho's haiku, calling everyone to attention with a single water's sound. Asculta, asculta. Once, I'm quite sure, I saw him as a small church mouse in the great jeweled temples, chewing holes in the robes of the high priest, making room for no thingness. 
then leaving warm droppings on the cold marble floor. I was there when he became a jungle lion. His passionate roars encouraged the hearts of the frightened, striking fear of those that pretended strength. As a spider, he spins word webs, weaving fabric soft and strong, as good for baby blankets as for work pants. Reading poems, the words roll thick with accent off his Austrian-born tongue in perfect timing, finding their ways like arrows to the heart. No, he has never walked on water. And besides, that's already been done. For I have seen him as very human, naked and exposed, the pain of personal struggle, anger, grief, loneliness, serving only to lend greater confidence to the I have been there too truths he often speaks. No matter what projection, devil or saint, and no matter that I am still not sure whether I am seeing him or the reflection of myself, shape shift as he might, his heart is always felt, gratefulness has new meaning. An original drunk monk, intoxicated with cup after cup of aliveness. turn. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I'm deeply touched by uh, all the work that has gone into preparing such an incredible party. I, I never expected anything like it. It was just wonderful. And I want to thank every single one of you for coming. And I'm particularly encouraged by the two young men who are here and who show, show us the future. They are really the future. But we don't have to wait until they grow up. Right now, each one of you can spread that message of grateful living just by living gratefully and, and tasting all the joy that that brings. And that is really my greatest joy this evening, to see that... <coughs> It's not me. I was very grateful for all the nice things that you said about me. But what really gives me joy is to see that this wave of grateful living, that flame of grateful living, is really setting the world afire. And that is what we need. And so I'm deeply grateful to each one of you, especially, of course, the ones that have prepared all this and our team and our website. And, uh, but to each one of you who came, and uh, usually when I think of what is the best word to say, sort of as an ending, I like to say, fear not. Uh, have trust in life, fear not. But today I say, fear not and run with it. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Hi. Hi. Thank you. We are adjourned.